and this was uh, the Brazilian Air Force, and they were heavily involved in this for three months, and there's still parts of it that were classified, and even Jacques doesn't know what it was, but he knew enough to tell the small group of people I was with to, to make all of the hair on our entire body stand up, because this, this was a lot of people, hundreds of Air Force people spending a lot of time taking a lot of pictures, all kinds of strange things happening. And, of course, the bottom line is there's something real going on, but nobody knows what it is. So that, that piqued my interest enough to say, okay, I'll, I'll write an article, and, and I did. And I, I published it uh, earlier in the year. And the, the, and the bottom line was something is definitely going on. Uh, I don't believe that anybody actually has – the, the final answer on what exactly it is, but for something of this magnitude, whether it's ET or whether it's something that, that we're doing in some strange way, mm. uh, it certainly deserves serious study. It certainly does. Um, you mentioned that you've had a number of private conversations with uh, Edgar Mitchell, yes? Mm-hmm. I, I've had uh, any number of opportunities to interview him on the air, and there was... Uh, there was one uh, one thing he said that has stuck with me, with me all the years, and I just I can't work it out. Um, he's a man who walked on the moon. Mm-hmm. There aren't many of those around, and um, we got into a pretty good conversation one night about it. And I I, I tried to ask him, remember for me what it felt like. To walk on the moon. I mean, can you give me a word picture of, of what your feelings were to step out and to walk on uh, another body? And um, I, 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 it was the strangest answer. He said, you know, Art, it's strange because I, 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 I remember it, but I don't remember the details of it. I mean, it's all kind of foggy to me. I don't. It's hard for me to give you that word, word picture you're asking for because I, I, there's something strange about my memory with regard to the whole thing. And um, I, I could never get over that. Uh, you would think something of that magnitude would be indelibly, every second of it, imprinted on your memory, and yet it was kind of foggy to him. Mm-hmm. Did you ever touch on that with him? Not specifically, but it, I, I think... Uh, there's a there's a cognitive reason for why that may be so. Uh, you know, if you go to a new place, which is w- w- where you haven't been before, and which is spectacularly beautiful, for example, right. oftentimes you'll you'll get a sense that this this doesn't even feel real. You know, this this can't be happening. This, you know, you, you have you have this kind of a shock effect that goes on, and and so you can imagine you you spent years training like crazy. And an extremely technical stuff with high danger at all times, sure. and, and now you're there, you know, and you have all this work to do. You don't have, you're just not having a picnic on the moon. He has a lot of things to do, uh, and and actually at that point didn't even know if they were going to be able to get off the moon. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure his mind was so preoccupied with simply doing the job uh, that it, it would be a little bit like asking a fighter pilot landing on an aircraft carrier in high seas. What did it feel like as you were landing with certain death about to occur? And the answer is, they have no idea. They they, yeah. they do what's necessary. But oh, it but just it was one of those things that yeah. Go ahead. On the way back, he suddenly had the first opportunity of actually relaxing a little bit, and that's when he had this big noetic experience. That's mm-hmm. what was a founding experience for our, our our whole institute. When he had the moment to relax and reflect on what he had just done. He had a full-blown mystical experience, and and the scientist in, in him said, "What in the world is this?" And that that was the origin of why we have this institute. Um, Edgar and others uh, who participated back in the days when our country did things like going to the moon, um, they've all made some intriguing statements. Uh, a lot of them have sort of refused to make statements. A lot of them have had troubled lives. Um, I, I wonder, when I listen to Edgar, as I mentioned to him a few moments ago, his statements have become progressively, as the years have gone on, stronger and stronger and stronger. And I wonder if there is, if there is something that he wants to say, something he wants to mention that he really hasn't 
said yet. Do you have any sense of that? No, I, I think it's just a matter of impatience. That there, <laughs> that, you know, there really is something going on. Uh, isn't it time, finally, that, that we can actually talk about it uh, oh. rather than having it always shoved out into the fringe? I mean, we can talk about it here in the middle of the night, uh, but but you know where where can you go in a in a mainstream serious uh, dialogue to to talk about it in a in a way that it it doesn't end up in the fringe, and they, we still don't have that, and that's mm-hmm. a pity. And the, of course, it's exactly the same pity for psychic phenomena and lots of other things. But it's just the the fabric of society allows certain things to be talked about and others others not. Okay, in the interest of time, moving on. Uh, there's something about the link between Alec. Guinness, who played the Jedi Knight, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, and the actor James Dean, mm-hmm. um, and James in his death, Dean's death. Yes. Um, what about that? Well, this is I ran across this as part of my research on presentiment, which is an unconscious form of precognition. Uh, there are many, many stories about premonitions, and I thought this was a particularly delicious one because uh, the the actor Alec Guinness, who, who played the Jedi Knight, who has special abilities, actually did have a real-life Jedi Knight type of experience many years before he played Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so on, on YouTube, you can actually search for this. Just just look up um, James Dean, Alec Guinness, and you'll probably get it. But the, the uh, anecdote was he was being interviewed by someone who said that he had, I heard you had a premonition of, of the death of James Dean. And the story was that this is back in the 1950s, that uh, by uh, by coincidence, he ended up having dinner with James Dean, and James Dean had just gotten a present of, of a fancy foreign sports car. And so he showed it to Alec Guinness, and it was still wrapped up and had a bow on it and stuff. Uh, and at that moment, uh, Alec Guinness had this this strange experience, and he said, he just said in a far-off way that, you know, I, I advise you not to get into this sports car because if you do, one week later you will be dead. In the sports car, and then, he you know, actually Dean, wait. He actually said that aloud. He did, and and so James Dean, you know, gave him a funny look, and well, what what does that mean? And Alec Guinness sort of snapped out of it and said, "Well, you know, I don't know where that came from, but there it is." And, and sure enough, a week later to the day, James Dean was killed in that car. And so the interviewer asked him, and, and you'll see in the YouTube clip, he asked him, uh, "Did this ever happen before?" And Alec Guinness kind of laughed and said, "No," and I'm kind of glad it never did because it was so it was so strange. So, th- I mean, here's it, it's a perfect case of uh, life and fiction sort of merging in, into each other. It really is, yes. Yeah. Huh. I, I I described to you on a previous program. I've had exactly that sort of experience just w- one time in my life, and never again. And I, I wonder how many people have had that sort of precognitive moment that never repeats itself and no matter how you try it doesn't repeat itself and and no matter how you try you can't ignore it when it happens mm-hmm. my my guess is a very large percentage that the in other words this kind of experience of premonition or any kind of psychic experience these, these are not magical things that just descend from the heavens they must be with us all the time it's got to be here it's got to be a part of the fabric of reality and the reason why we pay attention to it every so often is because we're in some strange altered state where we're not paying attention to the here and now, and it allows these things to bubble up from our unconscious. And that's probably why these kinds of experiences are most often described in dreams and uh, with certain drugs and drumming and anything that pulls you out of your ordinary state of awareness, because that's that's where it lives. It's, we're like we're embedded in it all the time. Um. Is there any hint of what might be a trigger to this kind of uh, experience at all? Because in my case, there was none whatsoever. I, I, I couldn't stop it when it happened. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, I had no control over it whatsoever. No, I, I no, no idea of what the trigger was. I was paying attention to something else altogether at, at the time it occurred. And is there any? It, it, in all the research of this sort of thing, is there any idea, does anybody have any idea what the trigger for this might be? It just seems to come out of nowhere and never come again. Non-ordinary state of awareness combined with typically with emotional motivation to, to force this unconscious information to bubble up. And now the beginnings of a couple of environmental barriers. 